Thank you. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to be part of this, this symposium. I've enjoyed the, the previous two talks. And so I don't know if I'll quite get us back on time, but I'll do uh, what I can to leverage uh, these the outstanding background that the other two speakers uh, provided. Uh, this is just a little view of, of Madison, Wisconsin, for those of you who have never been here. Uh, this is in the upper Midwest of the United States, north of Chicago. Uh, and so it is often a place that people fly over rather than uh, actually visit. So, um, but I'm going to uh, focus specifically on oxidation processes. And so uh, there's a uh, Jeremy gave a, a very nice background. He talked about oxidation, but a lot of the processes that he does and many people in the community of Lingen uh, focus on uh, reductive processes. There's good reasons to do this. Uh, there are many reasons to want to make things like jet fuels or other uh, valuable products derived from reductive cleavage of these uh, CO bonds and and carbon carbon bonds in in lignin. Um, we uh, started with a, a premise that there may be opportunities uh, in particular uh, using catalytic oxidation. This is partly uh, justified by the fact that that's where my expertise lies, uh, but then also uh, because there may be uh, privileged opportunities and applications uh, related to oxidized uh, lignin fragments and oxygenated uh, monomers derived uh, from lignin uh, byproducts. Um, in particular, and I think this builds on uh, Lindsay's uh, beautiful talk. In fact, I was very intrigued to see uh, his work on acetovanilone, which is one of the products that uh, many bugs uh, don't naturally uh, uh, eat and, and convert. And so uh, this, is, this is something that is of broad interest. We're part of this uh, center in the United States. It's one of the bioenergy research centers. There's about four of these uh, around the United States. One of these is called the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. And so that's uh, centered at Madison, University of Wisconsin, Madison and Michigan State University with partners uh, elsewhere. Um, but the whole notion here in the center is to develop the, the biological sciences that would facilitate ligand depolymerization or biomass conversion more broadly, uh, including the sugars, of course, um, but one of the recalcitrant components, of course, is lignin. So we have this idea of a lignin to bioproduct processing pipeline that really uh, borrows on many of the concepts that Lindsay was talking about is can we find ways to take this material uh, that comes from pulp and paper or dedicated uh, biorefineries and find ways to funnel it uh, using biology into value-added products. Uh, part of the premise is that we're getting uh, 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 as Brits might say, a bloody mixture of these products uh, from, from lignin upon depolymerization, whether you do it reductively or oxidatively. Uh, and the question is, is can we funnel that into a, a single value added product? So that's really how we started. I want to uh, kind of take a historical view uh, in the first portion of the talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know our work, um, we started, as I mentioned, uh, focusing on oxidation. And, and this was about a decade ago that we got started in this space. Um, and it was really a, what I'll call a, uh, a bottom-up uh, strategy, just thinking about fundamental mechanisms. My background is catalytic oxidations uh, broadly, organometallic chemistry, uh, organic synthesis. Uh, and so when we were invited into the Bioenergy Research Center, the, the real question was, what can we do with lignin? I didn't even know what lignin was, uh, much less what we could do with it. Uh, but when I looked at the structure, uh, what I focused on was these alcohols, right? There's two diff distinct alcohols that are very, very common in lignin. Uh, this is the, one of the most prevalent fragments is beta-04, but you also see these primary aliphatic alcohols uh, coming off of some of the other units, the, the beta uh, type units. Um, and in that case, the question was that we posed was really one of uh, just a, a, as an organic chemist, going back to say sophomore organic chemistry. Can we find a reagent or ideally catalytic method and preferably an aerobic oxidation method that would chemoselectively oxidize one or the other with the premise that if we got either one, uh, we would have a pathway uh, for selective cleavage uh, of this, this linkage. So that was, that was the starting point. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, this, these are textbook examples, right? Chromium oxide, things we learn in undergraduate chemistry. Uh, the blue bars reflect oxidation at that activated benzylic alcohol. Uh, the red or pink, uh, the, the pink is essentially the cleavage product arising from uh, primary uh, alcohol oxidation. And what you see is the vast majority go after the secondary benzylic, which is the more electronically activated site, but a few actually go after the primary. I'm going to spend mostly uh, focusing on uh, the, the, the benzylic, but, but uh, it turns out that we also have methods now 
that have substantially improved upon this initial screen. Um, but what we found was a, a rather simplified uh, catalytic system using this NOx redox co-catalyst and this tempo oxymonium uh, system for alcohol oxidation using O2 uh, as an oxidant. This worked on a series of models. Um, and uh, I, I love this HSQC0 uh, method that Jeremy uh, introduced. This unfortunately came out about six years too late for this original study. Um, but, but, but I think Jeremy's method is, is an ideal way to do a more quantitative uh, job here. Um, so what we were showing using HSQC was really just qualitatively, although semi-quantitatively, uh, estimates. Um, we were seeing that not only could we do the monomers uh, that, you know, these model compounds, which you can see many of them go in, in quite excellent yields, um, but this, these excellent yields actually translated to the, the lignin itself. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is this kind of, this is the aromatic region of a proton spectrum. So you can see seven. So these are the aromatic region. These, these are the benzylic uh, positions, the benzyl alcohol positions. Um, and as you go forward, what happens is you start to see uh, these groups, for example, if you look at those blue groups, those correspond to the uh, aromatic rings that are present in the G subunits that have the alcohol present. But as you uh, oxidize, you subject the actual lignin uh, to the oxidation conditions, what you see is those uh, G units disappear and you start seeing the appearance of these so-called G prime units. And those G prime units now have a ketone. So they're pulled a little further downfield uh, in the proton spectrum, uh, and that reflects the, the oxidation of an alcohol to uh, a ketone. These are all calibrated using monomer uh, systems that basically calibrate the, the chemical shifts, and by correlating the proton and C13 uh, chemical shifts, you can assign these. And we were getting what looked like about 90% conversion of the alcohols into the corresponding ketones uh, in the lignin uh, backbone. Now, the question is, so we've been able to oxidize uh, the, the alcohol to a ketone. This is just a model. What about this depolymerization? Jeremy alluded to this. Um, we actually started by anticipating that we would need to do some redox chemistry uh, because there was some precedent that a reducing metal like zinc could promote the reductive cleavage adjacent to a ketone by making a radical anion. In fact, that does work. You can see about a 74% yield uh, here making this reductive cleavage product. But what you actually see is when you go to other metals, uh, we actually weren't seeing a reductive cleavage process at all. It was just a hydrolysis product. So this formally is just a hydrolysis uh, to afford the phenol. Uh, and you're essentially doing an elimination reaction. If you think about it, you've got an, an acidic group there that's basically formally eliminating uh, and, and hydrolyzing uh, to add an oxygen at that carbon uh, at this position. I'll show you a little bit more about how that works. But the point is, we don't need these metals at all. Uh, we, of course, we don't want these metals. Uh, just by having a formic acid formate, we originally added formic acid with a reducing metal, thinking electrons plus protons is formally the equivalent of hydrogen. Uh, but when you just add an acid in its conjugate base, turns out that hydrolysis is even better. Uh, this basically can be rationalized, and I'm, I'm sparing you some of the mechanistic details uh, for, for time's sake. Uh, but essentially, the formic acid acylates that accessible primary alcohol, that makes that into a leaving group, which now can undergo an elimination from the acidic proton here. Uh, this will eliminate to make this vinyl ether fragment, which is just a mass ketone. So that becomes a ketone, you will release the phenol, and now you've cleaved the lignin bond. Okay, and so we have full kinetics, we've made each of these intermediates and showed uh, the reaction time course with this, again, in backup slides, if you want to see them. Um, the key point is, if you don't oxidize that benzylic alcohol, there is no cleavage. So you, you'll start reacting, like you'll start acylating the product, so you get high conversion to something, uh, but you don't get the CC cleavage or the CO cleavage uh, taking place uh, under these conditions. That behavior is replicated in the oxidized lignin that I mentioned. If you don't oxidize the lignin, most of it remains unreacted. That's basically the vast majority is unreacted. There's a little bit of background uh, native ketone uh, in the lignin. We think that accounts for most of the product that you see with native lignin. But if you do an initial oxidation step, boom, that uh, opens it up for the subsequent cleavage step. Uh, and that's what we're basically showing here, where we were able to identify about half of the products derived from that uh, lignin feedstock. Now, buried underneath this, and I just want to shout out to Jeremy's uh, work with the aldehydes, you know, this was done with an enzymatic extraction with no reference to thinking about how much original lignin 
uh, you know, we obtained in that extraction process. The intent of this was to get a near native type lignin, uh, even if we only we sacrificed the majority of lignin. So we wanted to do these, uh, what I'll call fundamental studies, uh, really just with a, a as close to native lignin as possible. So now uh, this was a nice kind of early uh, step, I think, uh, in terms of kind of showcasing uh, the, the virtues of, of oxidation as a prelude to uh, subsequent cleavage. Um, you know, there's now lots of different processes. So, you know, this was our initial uh, oxidation process that led to these benzylic ketones and our initial formic acid. But it turns out there are many different processes now. Uh, uh, Jeremy mentioned uh, the DDQ process that, that uh, Lee Westwood uh, reported. There's, there's other processes that will oxidize this activated alcohol to the ketone. And there are many processes that will take advantage of that ketone and cleave it. So I think this validates that initial hypothesis that we had very early uh, when we got into this work that if we do selective redox, we can now set the stage for selective cleavage. Um, it turns out there's a, a complementary class of primary alcohol oxidations. I showed you a little bit of that with Temple Bleach uh, in the early days. We now have some, some electrochemistry. There's some other methods uh, wherein you have a sterically controlled conversion to an aldehyde or carboxylic acid which then can undergo retroaldol or other types of cleavage uh, processes to corresponding monomers. So this type of two-stage process, at least conceptually, uh, you know, provides a frame of reference for thinking about uh, converting lignin in, into monomeric structures. Um, nonetheless, we wanted to do better. Uh, I would say the two-step process turned out to be rather challenging to scale. Um, and, and so we, we basically stepped back and said, okay, maybe we want to rethink uh, how we're doing this. And I have two short stories that I want to share. Um, one related to what I'll call process lignans, where you essentially have a pretreatment process, think paper pulp, you know, where the focus is carbohydrates and you spin off this waste lignin. Can we do something with some of these process lignans uh, that are generated from these various pretreatment processes? Um, and then increasingly, there's been focus on the so-called reductive uh, redox uh, catalytic fractionation. I call it redox rather than reductive because uh, this, this field started with reductive catalytic fractionation, but we've been focusing on or asking the question whether we could achieve something similar, wherein you take the raw biomass subjected to a catalytic process, directly affording aromatics from lignin depolymerization as well as the sugars. Um, and so that's essentially uh, the, the, the short stories that I want to uh, share with you. Essentially, one focused on this process lignin this is essentially now stepping back. You know, the first story was really looking at well-defined or, organic molecules, testing their reactivity and seeing if that, the reactivity that we, we uncover with these small molecule models can apply to lignin. In this case, we're just gonna start with brute force. We're gonna take the process lignin and start subjecting it to processes. Um, and the inspiration uh, comes from the Beauregard Lignotech process, which is, has many different variants now uh, in the literature in, involving copper, uh, NO2 under alkaline conditions. We saw one of those uh, on Lindsay's slides. Um, we started by just asking, we had this so-called copper AHP. This just happens to be one of the pretreatment methods that was being developed within the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center by uh, Eric Hegg and David Hodge. It basically involves a hydrogen peroxide modified alkaline uh, pretreatment process, the, 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 the uh, oxidant hydrogen peroxide and the copper co-catalyst and that process was facilitating uh, the, the separation of the sugars. And they've been able to do some really impressive work optimizing the sugar production from that process. Um, we were basically brought into a, a joint project with them uh, specifically to ask whether the lignin they generate during that process could be used uh, as a feedstock. And so that's the, the short story that I wanna share with you. Um, and the idea was, you know, can we subject this material, this lignin that comes from this copper AHP pretreatment uh, to access sugars, can we take their lignin extracts and actually uh, convert it into monomers? It's, you know, we had to learn the hard way. If you start running strongly alkaline conditions in glass vials, you know, that we're showing our na naivete in the early days, you know, you just basically leach glass, right? You know, so you just etch the glass with strong alkali. So we turned to Teflon cups and put them in a, in a pressure vessel also fine, okay, but the problem is, is that this is a pretty darn efficient process. You're at very high temperature, strongly alkaline conditions. You only need a few minutes to depolymerize and you spend most of your time actually heating up all the, 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 the material here and then cooling it down. So it's a very poor process, uh, it, although we were able to get it to work and we were able to get even 30% plus you know, yields of these oxygenated aromatics. Um, 
I don't have, a, it, we're, we're still in the process of working on the, the bioconversion, but I might just mention, you know, one of the reasons that I didn't mention in the context of this biological funneling and some of the work like, like uh, uh, Lindsay presented is the moment you start putting all these oxygens on the ring, they become more uh, soluble in water, right? So the idea is that these become much more bioavailable. Uh, in principle, you ought to be able to run uh, the, the bioconversion more efficiently because you should be able to get these more accessible uh, to the microbes by virtue of their in enhanced solubility relative to hydrogenated or reductively cleaved materials. Uh, so that was the premise. Um, and it turns out that we're doing pretty well on this, what I'll call process lignin. So you can see our yields are now 30%, which is actually quite good. Um, not what we were, the 50% that I was showing you earlier uh, from the pristine lignin that, that I mentioned. Um, and so, but what it suggests is that this lignin is actually uh, rather impressive. Um, however, as I mentioned, we don't like the batch process, right? So if you're gonna do batch, there's multiple problems. One is you have very little process control for such a, a fast reaction. Uh, second is throughput is gonna be problematic. So we took a page out of our pharmaceutical study. So we have been developing uh, ostensibly green oxidation methods for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, showing uh, how to use O2 for selective alcohol oxidation, as it turns out, which was essentially the progenitor for this project. Uh, and we had developed this uh, uh, tube and shell uh, reaction, if you will. Uh, the idea was to work with a tube that was permeable. So Teflon tubing uh, and other uh, fluoropolymers actually are, are, mis are, are permeable to oxygen. Uh, you can see in this case, the, the gas is essentially going out of the tube. In this case, we're actually gonna run our liquid through the Teflon tubing and take the gas and send it in through the tubing uh, in what is effectively a, a shell and tube or a tube and shell uh, a reactor uh, where, you, where you essentially have a membrane reactor uh, where the gas is being delivered continuously. And so it gives you very good process control. So, you know, there's basically a, a, a compelling alternative to say slug flow where you have alternating liquid solid or liquid gas, liquid gas bubbles. Um, but it's, it's, it's a more uh, a, a continuous delivery of the oxygen throughout uh, the entire process. So even better process control than, I, than the slug flow in my view. Um, so can we adapt this to lignin? Short answer is yes. And so what you see here, and again, just to highlight, you know, the, the idea is that we can send, you know, through this Teflon tubing, we're just sending liquid right up into the pressure reactor. Uh, you basically drill a hole in your pressure vessel uh, and you have your, your, your tubing basically coiled inside uh, and you can send it out another port uh, into a back pressure regulator. So you essentially have good control. Uh, and what this allows us to do is to achieve reactions that are now on the order of say three minutes. Uh, you know, essentially reactions complete. What I'm showing you here is different pressures of oxygen. You can see the higher the pressure of oxygen, the faster the reaction, uh, as you might expect. But you'll also notice that you don't have much window of tolerance, right? It reaches a peak, and then you start to see the yield starting to go down if you let it go for longer resonance times. Now, the beauty of a flow process is you actually have that control. So you can sit at this peak, but you don't have a lot of window of tolerance for kind of variations. And so now uh, you may want to broaden that out by working at slightly lower times and slightly longer reaction times. You don't take much of much of a hit on yield and you get much better uh, process control parameters uh, associated with this reaction. Now operating basically at, at four minutes uh, rather than three minute residence times. Okay, um, we can show that, you know, this is, this is essentially showing that uh, you get, here's the, the biomass S to G ratio. Uh, under nitrogen, it turns out that you get a little bit of extract, you know, from the, from the monomers. Um, it turns out that it has the S to G ratio that you expect based on the uh, analysis of the lignin material. Um, but when you do the oxidative uh, extraction, it turns out that the S is a little bit more labile. And so we're basically pulling out a little bit more S, but the S is also more susceptible to de oxidative degradation. And so that's why you see us now approaching uh, and then even eventually going below if we keep oxidizing uh, that the G is less susceptible to oxidation relative to S. Uh, but we can get all this information and you can see you know, the exquisite control over the process uh, you know, through this continuous flow uh, system. Um, we can start to uh, explore uh, the different materials. And so this, you know, you can see, this is Jeremy's uh, glyoxalate uh, stabilized lignin, one of the best lignins. In fact, the only reason it's not as good as copper HP, to be honest, 
uh, is because this was poplar and we're counting the perhydroxybenzoate that kind of comes along for the ride in poplar. Uh, if we just looked at lignin derived aromatics, these guys would be sitting right on top of each other. So just highlighting the beauty and, and the, the other beauty of Jeremy's material as he highlighted is that you're talking about something that's got 90 plus percent extraction efficiency uh, from the actual wood. So you're basically getting almost quantitative uh, lignin extraction, and now you're getting 35% yield of monomers. And so we're basically talking about a process that's that's hard to, to beat, even with some of the uh, catalytic fractionation uh, methods that I'll, I'll mention uh, momentarily. Um, it turns out that it also works with softwoods. Uh, so even just, you know, you buy craft from Sigma Aldrich, uh, you can get 10% yields. Uh, and so uh, this actually works remarkably well, even with what you call crappy lignin. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it doesn't work with some of the low sulfur stuff from Canada. Uh, sorry, Lindsay, but that, that, that craft mill needs to kind of find ways. Now, it, it may be that we could get this improved because you can see it's still rising. Uh, so maybe we could do a little bit better uh, if we kept working on this because maybe, maybe it, would, it would plateau a little higher. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that, you know, we can work the copper HP pine turns out to be some of the best. Uh, just highlighting the merits of the copper HP process. Um, but but even these kinds of rather you know conventional process lignans, these these um, materials uh, that come from paper mills, you know could could even be a, a source because this ten percent yield, uh, and this of course now is going to be G rich, so it's basically going to have acetovanillone and vanillin, uh, a little bit of vanillic acid basically as the the compositions uh, of these materials. So it's a much narrower distribution uh, of materials. Okay. However, um, when we work with hardwoods, we get a mixture, okay? And so you can see we can optimize this. We're now, you know, approaching 45% yield uh, of some of these monomers after process optimization. And what I can say is, you know, even with our simplified just single tube reactor, um, we can approach 100 grams per day, okay? So this is not, uh, this, this is the kind of thing uh, that, you know, even with, you know, not thinking commercially, uh, you know, if there's collaborators on the line that would like monomers to, play with, with microbial conversion, we can deliver, uh, you know, large quantities that, that I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a potential bugaboo uh, in, in a moment, but, you know, this is essentially generating lots of monomers uh, per day. Okay. That problem uh, that I mentioned that may prevent, you know, the, the, the collaborations that we're eager to pursue is, is just now being resolved. Okay. And so the problem is, is that you do get this bloody mixture, right? You get this, these monomers, but you also get all the oligomers. Um, which also, you know, you'd like to find uh, value for in, in this space. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out new techniques to basically separate uh, some of these monomers using this technique called centrifugal partition chromatography. It's basically uh, a, 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 an improved throughput liquid-liquid extraction. So you're not sitting there with a set funnel, you know, shaking it uh, by, the, by your hands, uh, but rather doing it continuously. There's other variants of this called countercurrent chromatography that are out there. These are two of the, the, the main commercial variants uh, are the centrifugal partition chromatography, which basically is a, a steel drum with these little kind of uh, little uh, reservoirs kind of fit in there. And you essentially use a centrifugal force to basically force uh, the liquid through or down. And you basically have a, 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 an ascending or descending mode, so-called, depending on which direction you, you send your liquids uh, and and the uh, the dense the density of the the liquid phase, but basically you have two emissible phases, uh, and essentially they're kind of kind of established. This this field is is rather well established, but basically you're looking for materials. I forget how much detail I included, not much. Um, but basically this is something called the Arizona system. It's basically taking water, methanol, ethyl acetate, and some alkane like pentane or heptane. So you have essentially ethyl acetate and, and the and the alkane green and red here up at the top, that's basically forming your, your hydrophobic phase. Then you've got a hydrophilic, immiscible hydrophilic phase uh, that's made of water and methanol. And just by varying the ratios, you basically can optimize how the separation proceeds. This is an example. Basically, you take your mixture, you put it on the column, and we were able to separate the, the vanillin, uh, the syringic acid, and then we got a mixture. So we basically got three co a collection of three compounds as a mixture, which we then uh, subjected to a modified solvent phase. Uh, it turns out now we have just a single separation, so we don't have to do the two-stage system. It's not uh, quite ready for, for sharing. Uh, we're still working on it, but uh, this basically is showing the model systems where, you know, essentially if you use model systems, you don't have any background oligomers and other things that crap things up, and so you can get near quantitative recovery impurities uh, of, of individual molecules. When you take the lignin extract, 
you know, we're still doing, you know, and you're kind of fighting a balance between do you want more recovery or do you want more purity? And so, you know, this is basically just where we ended up drawing the line for this uh, first demonstration where we were able to get, you know, 80 to 90 percent uh, purities and about 50 to 70 percent, in this case, 80 or 90 percent uh, recoveries. And so, uh, so I get, sorry, the, the parentheses are the purities, the recoveries are in the in the top without the parentheses. But essentially what you're seeing is, you know, essentially the extraction. This is just an optical uh, detector basically looking at uh, the, the, the peaks that are coming off. Um, so that that separation, I think, is going to be the ticket uh, to now deliver these monomers to the bioconversion people like Lindsay or Greg Beckham or other people uh, here in the GLBRC that we collaborate with. Um, okay, so one final process. Um, and I think I better call it quits here pretty soon, but I just want to highlight uh, that we've been interested in these non-precious metal catalysts um, for various reasons for aerobic oxidation. We subjected, uh, this is essentially what's known as an oxidative catalytic fractionation. You have seen this, many of you probably will have seen this before in the reductive catalytic fractionation side. You put your catalyst in a cage, you start around the carbohydrates are not soluble in these organic solvents. So they basically sit at the bottom. The, the aromatics, the lignin in red is basically coming off and it gets depolymerized by the catalyst and the aromatics then come out in the mix. And what you see here is now just direct from biomass, a 25% yield using one of these cobalt NC catalysts. So just again, these are basically these materials. I don't have time to give a full background on these materials, but essentially there's these carbonaceous materials with metals impregnated in nitrogen dope carbon. Um, they turn out to be even better than the noble metal catalyst. So it's not just going to non-precious metal. They're actually performing better. Um, you can see the difference when you have uh, oxygen, or oxygen plus catalyst, you can see that even oxygen alone does some background oxidation, um, but the monomer yields uh, are substantially better when you have the catalyst. Uh, let me see if I've got the control. Uh, there's the control less than 10%, you can get up to 25% uh, with the catalyst. Okay, and so this you know, is basically showing that this retains uh, good carbohydrates. We've been able to just do an acidolysis uh, an analysis to kind of capture the, the C6 and C5 sugars. Um, the C5s are a little more problematic in terms of their recovery. Uh, we don't do as well with them. Uh, the C6s uh, do quite well. And I think the problem is the xylose is sufficiently soluble in some of the organics that you start to degrade them. Um, but the lignin uh, can be recovered, um, mainly in the form of monomers uh, in this case. Um, I have a little backstory. We've made some plasticizers from these mo molecules. You know, Using the separation method, we can now start to get each of these individual carboxylic acids, use those making these, these bioaryl dicarboxylic acids. I'm not gonna tell you about the electrochemical process to get there, but basically you can make all permutations of HH, GG, SS, and then the corresponding heterocoupled. And these are great plasticizers, okay? And so at least uh, the preliminary analysis also shows that they should be less toxic uh, than the conventional, uh, these phthalate uh, plasticizers and their performance is actually even better uh, in, based on the plasticizer data with PVC. So that's with lignin-based monomers. That's one of the directions we're going, trying to utilize these monomers uh, in an effective way. Okay, so I better conclude. Um, and let me, but before I do that, I better thank some people. So this is the team uh, that's basically been doing a lot of this work, going back to, uh, uh, let's see who I can call out. Let me just call out a couple of people. This Eric Wieda is doing all of the flow aerobic oxidation in collaboration with Chris Holland. Um, Suraj is doing the separations uh, that I mentioned to you. Uh, and how low uh, is the one who did the uh, kind of oxidative variant of catalytic fractionation working on raw biomass? Eric Haig has that copper HP process. Uh, Greg Beckham is now doing some of the bioconversion work and we've always benefited from our colleague, uh, John Ralph, who's kind of LinkedIn guru, uh, as many of you know. Uh, and so we've really benefited from him and Thatcher Root has been helping us with the, the flow process. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, that was amazing. Um...